arguably on way one way of looking at that it makes it much more fun much more exciting um contemporary poetry not just in translation is is often about the idea of kind of play and determinant and what you can do with um an pre-existing lexis vocabulary text and so translation you know you can argue that translation is the most radical writing strategy because determinant is hot wired into translation uh, the novalis quote at the bottom of this slide is um well it's always good to back up your bullshit with with quotes from famous um poets and 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 authors isn't it so um i've, I've liberally scattered some uh, quotes um all the way through my presentation of course uh, to give me a sense a, a degree of gravity um couple more quotes. I'm not going to read them because um, I'm going to assume that you can all read, um, given that you're in Richard's class. Here we go. More stuff. Um, the original is unfaithful to the translation. A very famous um, painting. I don't know if you're familiar of this um, painting. Um, the original actually um, was painted in the Hogs Mill River, about two kilometers from where um, I'm speaking now. Uh, the woman who lay in the river caught her death of cold and was always very ill for the rest of her life after doing that. Here we go. Uh, translating the name translation. Poets are, it's like herding cats. That's the English expression, trying to get poets to do anything. Um, with any degree of, of, of uh, agreement or rigor. And so here we go, Gertrude Stein, as I said, really my most important original translator, um, called her translations um, Reflections. Robert Lowell called his Imitations. Basil Bunting called his Overdrafts. He, he um, decided that Shakespeare needed editing. And so he edited a lot of Shakespeare's, um, I think, sonnets. And, and made them into, um, he felt, better uh, pieces of writing. Haroldo de Campos, reinventions, transcreations, poetic reorchestrations, reimaginations. Um, translanation is another um, compound uh, word which um, is being used to talk about translation practice um, and poetry. The longest, I think the longest quote I'm going to throw at you is just this one. Um, I will read it because when I'm finished reading it, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, for postmodern writers, folks, that's us, I guess. Translation marks an acceptance of the impossibility of origins. Um, an opening of play between before and after time is, a, is something more prob problematic for 21st century humans, a reveling in multiplicity. Well, this writing is marked then by its openness to play, which is certainly what I'm going to be showing you about for a lot of this talk. It's none, not the less serious in undermining definitions of truth and authority and originality that have been held sacred. What we're doing with this writing attempts to understand how these sacred structures ensured a kind of failure. Uh, failure might be turned into a success. So for me, translation, of course, you can do a lousy translation, but um, the idea of um, problematizing and undermining kind of the voice of authority. And I kind of, one thing I'm not gonna talk much about here, but we might come back to in question and answer is about the idea of who you translate as well as how you translate. My um, irreverent um, translations are <clears throat> of canonical writers. And I think there's a very big difference between translating um, and deterring um, a canonical writer, Petrarch, Horace, um, Ovid, than, for example, deciding that you're going to wreak havoc um, to the work of a person whose work is appearing for the first time in the language that you're, you're writing. So that's important to, to really flag up. 
Um, the business, the, the flip side to what Chamberlain says is kind of cultural imperialism, right? And how you will talk about this later in the presentation, but the idea of feeling that one has a right to change, transform um, someone else's writing can be seen as, a, you know, a kind of terrifyingly imperialist um, mode of, of engaging with a text. And so Chamberlain's quote is great in that it undermines authority. But of course, you always have to ask who, who gives you the authority or the permission to do that as well. Um, Steve McCaffrey, BP Nickel, important um, <clears throat> English Canadian um, couple who, who, who wrote together a lot have again talked about translation being a creative endeavor. I guess I backed up my, my kind of basic premise that, that this is interesting with enough quotes at this point. Um, <clears throat> moving on to talk about my own practice. Um, I'm going to show you a number of techniques and that I've used and of how that I've worked on them in my own poetry and how these techniques work with other poems. Hopefully these are fun. Hopefully you will be able to get pleasure from using these yourself. The way that I write usually, not always, is I look at one or more source texts. I usually um, translate. Roman Jacobson has got three different translation types. The, the first translation type he talks about is translating from what the same language, for example, taking an English text and making it a different English text. So I very often look at, with Petrarch and with Horace, there are lots and lots of different translations of the same Latin poem with Horace. And so I would look at lots of different English translations of the, the Latin poem. Then I apply different translation methods. And my main method is called elusive translation. Elusive translation or elusive referential translation is number four in the list of strategies that I use. At the end of this presentation, I'm not going to talk about them today, but if you want to look at the PowerPoint, you will see all of my different large types of um, translation strategy. Um, elusive referential, I'm not going to read this word for word, but this method is when the translator reads a source text and then uses that source text to inspire and kind of fire the imagination to make creative associations which lead to the generation of a, another poem. The poem which is produced as the result of the elusive referential translation wouldn't and couldn't have existed without the source text. And so, so it's a translation, absolutely. It's not the kind that probably most people are used to reading or writing for that matter. But um, it's a method which was really kind of, what's the word, um, clarified by McCaffrey and Nickel in the 70s and 80s. But it's, of course, it's a method which in many ways has been used loosely for, for throughout the history of, of poetry. This is a list which I don't propose to read. It would drive you and me mad, I'm sure. But um, about 10 years ago, what I did was I came up with or categorized 73 different methods that a creative translator could use when looking at, of course, source texts, text to translate. Um, I made those methods into a poem you can see the title of the poem. Um, it was published in the fabulous Alba magazine nearly 10 years ago uh, now. And I have used all of these methods in my own writing. If anyone wants to kind of talk more about these methods, um, 
happy to go back and, and talk about them. I'm going to talk about some of them in the next slides. Uh, one I'm not going to talk about is number 22, make a poem out of the footnotes. Um, in my Petrarch translations, many of the translations had a great deal in different books, would have different footnotes. And so instead of having the translation of the poem itself, I made up a new poem, which consisted of all of the footnotes to that poem and made a new poem out of that. So that's, that's uh, one way. Um, I'm going to get sucked into talking about all of these if I don't move on. Um, but here, there's the list, folks. Please do feel free to, to ask me again about them or you know, use them for your own practice. Um, Ignacio, you've said you always feel the pressure of the original author. Um, it's a ghost that follows you. Fantastic, right? I mean, I think um, in answer to that comment, the idea is that I'm an extremely codependent human being and, and, and all of my kind of decisions in life and emotional responses to the world are always kind of taking into consideration what other people are thinking and how I'm being judged and who I'm communicating with. And so this, the business of translation for me is great because you know the whole kind of cliche of the author translating or writing in a garret all alone wrestling you know with 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 the void um with translation you're never wrestling with the void you're dressing a, a dead body or you're 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 doing all of these things where you're having a hopefully very happy conversation with the author. When I translated Horace, I was living in Barcelona, it was before the internet, and it was impossible to um, read, get many books in English. Um, and I got an edition of Horace and hated it. I just, oh, it, it was really something I really disliked. So my translations of Horace started out through me having a big argument with Horace. And um, of course, the great thing when you argue with a dead person is that um, you can tell yourself that you win the argument. So again, um, it's all good. It's, translation is always very fun. Um, Richard mentioned some of my books. Um, here are some of them. I forgot that I wrote a couple of them. Um, Koto Iyo, I forgot, I forgot I wrote, and there it is in the corner. Um, that consisted in part of translations of the um, book Platero Iyo, um, and I transferred, I translated the donkey Platero in um, Platero Iyo to be my, my daughter Koto, and we moved from Andalusia to Barcelona. So you can see the kind of, my idea of translation is a very wide um, one, and I love Platero Iyo so much, so my writing a book coming out of um, Jimenez uh, was, was it was a homage. It was just a, a delight to be kind of feeling I was having a conversation. Um, I made this a long time ago, actually, when I was talking about translation in a slightly different context, this slide. But if you will, the idea of a Newton's cradle and some kind of energy, again, um, Ignacio, where you're talking about a ghost and the kind of energy being with you. For me, that kind of energy of the original poem being subjected to um, one method and another method and then being edited is kind of, the, as I say, this picture gives an idea of how I kind of see my translation working in a way. The, the top left-hand cover, that was, the, uh, that was the Horace that I bought in Barcelona in uh, 1992. And uh, well, I'm gl glad I bought it. But to begin with, before I started thinking that I had permission to mess around with it, it really annoyed me a great deal. Um, but that's, that's part of it, I guess, isn't it? Um, so we're going to look at some of my methods now. Um, and one of the methods is a method called dictionary translation. The definition of this method is I'm going to read it to take all the nouns in an existing text, look up the dictionary definitions, and then take out the original noun and in the text replace that noun with the dictionary definition. So a section 
of one of my translations from my book, um, Petrarch Collected Atkins. You can see it goes, it's No Lovely Stars That Roam Through Empty Skies is the uh, Musa translation. But for me, that becomes No Lovely Star. Star becomes Starling because I'm transforming star into Starling um, through a method I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then Starling, British bird, noisy birds with don't, no lovely noisy birds with dark shiny feathers that roam through. Skies become skirt in the first translation and N plus seven translation. And then the dictionary definition of skirt through empty pieces of clothing for a woman or girl that hangs from the waist. And doing this kind of translation, clearly there's a the love of surprise and of um, vocabulary and the, 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 the richness of expression which is available to us is something which many of these methods bring up. Another method that I use is the method of translating words that you know. So here I did look at Petrarch's um, original Italian. You can see it down at the bottom there, the first four lines of this particular um, poem from the Canzoniere. And I just translated the words that I thought that I probably understood in English. And then I located them on the line, the dots, a kind of temporal spatial indication of um, what's going on. And so the, 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 the sonnet looked, there were more gaps than there are words there. But that, for me, that links with the idea of dub poetry, Jamaican music from the 70s. It also foregrounds the idea of the translator always in a way having partial knowledge. So, you know, kind of from, in a way, from a playful position, um, the implications are, you know, very serious. And, and for me, they're, they're fascinating about how these things all kind of play out. Um, the method which took star and made it starling comes from the French um, writers group, the Ulipo. And one of their methods, probably the most famous, is the N plus seven method, um, where you replace all the nouns in a text by a new noun, seven words further on in the dictionary. So the English um, 18th, 19th century um, poet, William Blake, one of his famous poems, here it is at the top. I don't know if it's well known at all in Spanish, um, but there is the poem to see a world in a grain of sand. When you take those three nouns and you count on seven in the dictionary, it becomes to see a worm in a grampus of sandblast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can see how that n plus seven method um, changes the poem completely. My favorite version of this is Miles Champion, English poet. He took um, Andre Breton's poem, um, Free Union, what is it, Union Libre, um, from the French, um, took the English translation and changed it using the N plus seven. And it took all of the cliches and metaphors, because Breton's poem is a beautiful um, love poem and kind of renewed and deterred and made equally exciting um, the language of love and the, the language of metaphorical sexual uh, engagement um, makes it an extremely kind of interesting and important renewal of the possibility of how metaphor is used in the kind of this, you know, the language of, of, of romantic love. Um, this quote, I'm not going to read this to you folks, I hope it's large enough for you to see. Um, this goes back to the idea of um, domestication is another method of um, translation. And with this domestication, it's where you replace the original setting of the poem with a setting which is kind of, doesn't have to be, but is usually going to be one which is more familiar to you. 
Um, John Denham decides that um, when translating Virgil, then Virgil and all that goes on, I know Virgil is a bit of a generalization, of course, but when translating Virgil, you can replace Virgil and put him down in, in um, 17th century England and give the Moors um, of 17th century England to the character and the narrative and of course the language um, that is going on um, in Virgil. I've said this already, but I think, you know, acceptable sometimes when this is going on with canonical poets, I think that the, the English um, imperialist um, desire to dominate and anglicize um, Alexander Pope was the most famous person, John Dryden, who was doing this to the classics. They, to my mind, they absolutely butcher them, do a terrible job. And the kind of chauvinism and imperialist chops that they display, um, I think their own work needs deterring um, very savagely to get revenge on them. But uh, I don't like their work, so I haven't done it. Um, so here is a domestication poem. You may, um, uh, Richard, you're saying Deryden is great. I hand you that uh, flaming um, chalice. It's all yours. Um, localizing Ignacia, yes, absolutely. So what we can see here is that the Carl William Carlos Williams poem, very famous in the English word, world, was taken by Tom Leonard, the Scottish often dialect poet, and he turned that poem into a very working class Scottish dialect um, poem. Given my time constraint, I'm not going to read that poem to you, um, but the, the Williams poem is one of the, my favourite poems ever, and I think Leonard, mm, he gets close with his poem, specials are extremely high alcohol beer, which are tended to be drank by alcoholics um, in Britain in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. And so he's domesticating Williams and making the kind of genteel poetry of Williams, sexy and genteel, of course, into a much more robust uh, and, um, no, let's just stick with the word robust, um, Scottish dialect um, poem. Okay, carrying on, folks. I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, one of the most, the most famous, I think, um, Japanese poem is by the poet Basho, the haiku. Um, here is a translation of it, word for word, as literal as possible. Old pond, exclamation, frog, jump in, water of sound, sound of water. If you translate it visually, this is Steve McCaffrey's translation of that poem visually. My favorite translation of that poem is by the little known poet Leroy Gorman, Canadian poet Leroy Gorman. Splat Ribich is just fantastic as far as I'm concerned. I wrote to Leroy Gorman and told him how much I loved his poems and how much I loved him and he never replied. So if you ever meet him, please tell him how much I love his translation. Um, okay. Another type of translation, folks, if you want to do this now, feel free, um, is a myopic translation. It's where you take a poem, you hold it as far away from your eyes until, as you can until you can't read it properly, and then you write what you think you see. Oh, no, that's not supposed to happen. Phew, there we go. So um, if you want to translate in the text box, what do you think the first line of this poem is? This is speed dating, everybody. Um, so do it quickly if you want. And of course, sit quietly at the back of the class if you have no desire to engage with what you think the first line of this poem is. Um, I did a number of my translations using um, this method. Um, and that yeah, was very pleasing. I enjoyed doing. Richard Parker, thank you very much. 
top of the class, uh, Professor Parker, I see. Okay. Um, Matthias, thank you. I, I fucking funny gas sunlight one, two, one, one, two. Or is it Unas Dos? Uh, I guess we translate it however we like. I finicking thirsty gave homage. Daniel, thank you very much. Here we go. Look, I, I just got disgusting. Heaven goes everywhere. It's bilingual. Very good. Oh, thanks, Edward. Uh, um, Edward. Um, okay, look, here we go. This is the answer. The great poet. Jeff Hilson, that's his poem. Now I'm, I'm gonna try and stick to 30 minutes for my talk. So I'm gonna speed on folks. You can, you can read this lovely poem as often as you like. Uh, Matthias, congratulations for getting fucking. Um, every time I did um, myopic translations, they were always vulgar, whether it said it or not. And it was so Freudian that I decided I had to stop at a certain point. So look, this is what I've been doing recently. I've been using Google Translate. So here's an example. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Um, there's the Hilson poem, and then you pop it into Google Translate, and um, you can have the um, translations in all kinds of language. Um, Jodidamente te amo meses, I think is much better in Spanish. Um, and so that's one thing I've been doing using Google Translate. I'm going to show you more. But what I've been, I'm keen, I've been racing forward because I've been wanting to show you this really. I need to get out of this slideshow and I need to get into my web page. And God knows if this is going to work. But I've been put posting poems on TikTok and on TikTok. Oh, man, that's not supposed to happen. Um, I hope you can see this at this point. And what I need to do is try and make it bigger. No, I can't make it bigger for some reason. I guess the screen is doing its stuff. I'm going to work on the assumption that you can just about see this, though, folks. And okay, I want to go bigger. Yeah, hooray! Look. So what you can do with the app Google Translate is you can put your phone on the the app, and then you can film the app. And so I've been putting the Translate app over books and doing this. I really love the poetry of Yosano Akiko. And this translation is done by a Japanese guy who was translating them into very 19th century um, English. Terrifyingly bad, really inappropriate in relation to the original, but maybe that's a good thing. So you can see what happens here. The child is a black one. Is it the beauty of spring? The child has black hair. Is it the beauty of, the child has black hair that grows into a comb? Is it the beauty of spring? So what you've got going on with these things is you've got a kind of living translation. All people who meet nicely are beautiful. Maybe not true, folks, but nevertheless, um, what you can see I've got going on is that kind of business of kind of having a living text um, where lines are changing all the time is something that I got really excited about. Um, I posted them up on TikTok. You can see on the page that I've put up, you can have a look. Um, I haven't done any for quite some time, but I will come kind of looking at them again for this talk. I kind of got excited again and thought, oh, I must go back and do this. OK, so I'm going to stop sharing that. Um, OK, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint and I've got about a minute or so left. So bear with me. Okay. Okay. 
Jeff Hilson again. You can't get enough Jeff Hilson. Um, another way of translating things is using the translation um, app, whatever you want to call it. And what I've been doing is translating a lot of uh, Freddy Holderlin. Um, and you can see the way that I have moved from the original to Google Translate to the elusive referential translation of the Google translation. So that idea of the whole business of the um, Newton's cradle, if that's what it's called, um, producing new poems is what we've um, got going on there. Um, have a look, folks, if you're interested at this the N7 um, translation machine. What you do is you put a text in here, go to the spoon bill, and um, then you get a choice of just pressing a button and um, it will give you all of the different N plus seven, et cetera, translations there. Here we go. I've got some links for you here if you're interested in following any of them up. A less playful, more serious version of this talk expansion is the one at the bottom, seven types of translation. I was able to just get it up in a PDF online. I hope that you can too. If, you, if they ask trying to charge you for it, um, email me and I'll send you a PDF, no problem at all. Um, it didn't cost me anything to write. And so you shouldn't have to pay for it as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's lots of links to kind of things going on there. Um, I want to say, oh, look, if you're interested, I put lots of follow up activities for you if you're interested. So you can carry on playing with this. Um, my TikTok, Antonia, what is my TikTok? That's a very good question. It is, can you see it there? Um, or is it cut off? I've got tons of the dialog boxes on edit.net at TikTok. So yeah, there you go. Have a look there. Um, how do I deal with metric? Um, by usually by completely ignoring it. Um, but what you can do is you can just write a poem um, using the metric and not looking at the poem. Um, I haven't done that because often, um, because I didn't enjoy it. Um, my final slide, but while we go to questions and answers, however, is this one. Um, you can see I typed in Tim Atkins and I found this rather similar looking gentleman to myself um, on Google Images. So I now use a very different Tim Atkins um, for my own um, picture. Um, when I use my biography. And these are all the translation um, transformations to my Google Books um, biography um, there. So that is that, my Clark Kent version. My, yeah, my, my more donuts version as well, isn't it? And, and back in time, about 50 years version too. But um, there you go, folks. I come in at round about 30 minutes haven't I so um it's a pleasure talking to you if you've got any questions for me I'm I'm good to go I'm good to stay thanks so much Tim thanks so much Tim yeah if anyone has any more questions that they want to put to Tim I think now's the time for it you can ask uh in the chat bar or with the microphone uh, and everything. Uh, yeah. And, and if anyone wants any any of this stuff, um, get in contact with me and I can sort you out and I can put you in contact with Tim and all of those things also. But yeah, does anyone have a, any questions to start us off? Uh, Catalina, from those 70, okay. 73 methods you mentioned, Tim, which ones would you suggest for our students to use when facing the challenge of maintaining structure, form and content? What do you reckon, Tim? The one which you can see in front of you here with the N plus one and N plus two, that translation machine, which you've got, you, of course, you don't have to use a machine. My book, which is coming out at some point from Boiler House, um, I used a dictionary to translate 
80 pages of text that I'd written. And what it does is you can see it keeps the structure, um, Catalina, um, the same, right? So on one level, um, that is good. The content, I guess it doesn't change. If you say I am a happy mandolin, um, that's different from a happy man. Um, so the content is going to be changed. Um, it's a rubbish answer in a way, but I would say go and have a look at the methods. And some of them are going to keep the content very similar. Some of them are going to be keeping the form similar. And, you know, form and structure will maintain, you keep the integrity of them. Um, and it's a case of, sorry, I it, go and have a look and kind of see what each one suggests. And you get very different results from all of those. I hope that's an okay answer. I know it's not perfect. Um, uh, Roxana, you have a Thanks question. Much, oh, go ahead, Richard. Sorry. Yeah, I wanted you to answer Roxana's one actually um, about about Horace because yeah, I want I want to just just as we finish, I would love to get you to speak a little bit more to Horace and or to Ovid maybe just to to see what as Roxana as Roxana puts it, what you're arguing about with them and what how what their work means to you. Oh, with pleasure. Yeah, yeah, with pleasure. Um, they were all different, my engagements with those three. Um, you know where I was saying it's about a relationship. Um, with Horace, I was, Horace is kind of about, in a way, a kind of political argument. Horace was the um, champion of the uh, at times, was champ champion of Imperial Rome. He was an apologist for the kind of conquests um, that the, the Roman army was making. I know that it was a bumpy ride in terms of relationship with the authorities, but um, I read Horace and was appalled by that idea of a poet being a kind of mouthpiece for... Um, an oppressive imperialist force. And so my kind of, that was my kind of disgust. And so when I started transforming um, Horace, I was trying to find ways of kind of turning, turning his arguments against empire. So one of the methods, going back, Catalina, to your question as well, is called antithetical translation, where you translate a poem to be the opposite of what you take it to be saying. Um, with Petrarch, um, Petrarch, I read when I lived in San Francisco, an absolutely beautiful um, translation of Petrarch, which made me love, um, love Petrarch's Canzoniere. And when I read the Musa and Durling translations, I found the, the engagement both kind of spiritual if you want to call it spiritual sexual romantic that was going on to be very problematized in that there were kind of stereotypes going on and so my engagement with writing my argument or, or conversation with Petrock was saying how does one because I remembered my first reading of Petrock about how beautiful it was um, I've got the the the, the book over there that I kind of absolutely loved, um, but I didn't look at it deliberately. And so my question was, how do I, as a white male poet, negotiate the language of kind of absent, the absent beloved, um, the, the kind of me highly metaphorical language and conflation of the kind of feminine with the divine. And so that was my kind of conversation with Petrarch. So I was trying to, and that's why the N plus seven um, was very useful for me and why the myopic translation was very useful in as much as the kind of recognition and transformation of particular phrases and what's the word? I suppose kind of estrangement, detournement of these kind of um, ways of talking about the other 
um, was was something which I, oh man, I really enjoyed that. It was a really exciting journey to go on. Kind of problem, and, and also saying, but Petrarch, you can't, you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that anymore. So that kind of business with that one was going on. With Ovid, given the state of the world, um, I'm also, I'm 59 years old, I'm getting older. Um, when I read Ovid's poems of exile, I was kind of very interested in t the tons of, for me, it's a very contradictory original text, his Tristia, in as much as he was sent into exile by a despotic emperor, for which you can read Donald Trump or Boris Johnson. Um, he was a, um, Ovid was a sexually polymorphously perverse um, poet, perhaps, um, who either he was a, a kind of force for liberation or he was a kind of oppressive um, male, uh, if that'll do, won't it? Um, equals problem in my book. So the idea of kind of contradiction between kind of, you know, a person who had cultural capital, but who had been sent into exile, a person who was, depending on your position, perhaps, was either a kind of force for sexual liberation or sexual oppression. I guess one of the kind of things that interests me most as a writer is about how I never feel like I reach a single position. I always feel that what's the what's the Whitman um, line? I embrace multitudes. So, you know, con I am. I, so I contradict myself. I embrace multitudes. Um, I, I kind of um, always feel like there are multiple positions to occupy. And Ovid really occupied that. Um, I, I was kind of disgusted by Ovid, disgusted by myself. I'm part of the patriarchy and work in a university, which I tend to feel is a uh, an oppressive imperialist um, uh, force generally. Um, certainly Oxford and Cambridge in, in the United Kingdom, virtually, you know, a terrifyingly bad um, place in terms of making the world a better place. And so um, that's, you can see, I'm still interested in all of these people. Ovid, there, there are, I never reach a resolution. So translation as a conversation is about saying, what do I think? What does that person give me? What do I give that person? How do I locate myself? Um, and I don't know, I, I, fuck, it's terrible being an old white man. And that's what my book's about in part. Um, okay, I'm, I'm trying to look at the questions and I'm multitasking and I can't do it. So Richard, what's next? De can you DJ another question for me? <laughs> I think we've got about seven minutes left. So time for two questions, I reckon. Okay. Um, I think I can see straight away two questions in the chat box. The first one's from Daniel Eltringham. This is a nice one. That was so great, Tim, thanks. I'm wondering about tensions uh, with codification of kinds of experimental translation and the sort of ideal of proliferation and play. Are we setting up a rival system of authority to that of original, inverted commas, and copy? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry. I mean, my, my good old I don't know answer. I know it can be a cop out, but... Um... Daniel, isn't do you want to come on the microphone if you want to explore that further with Tim? <laughs> yeah, I mean, isn't it a case of kind of just, you know, proliferation? Um, it, it's, it's, I don't see it, Dan, as being a, 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 yeah. a rival. I see it as being just an expansion. Does that help? Yeah, I suppose I suppose I suppose it's, it's it's coming out of like thinking about like like reservations around Ulupo more generally as well, and and these kinds of like codifications of experimental praxis. As, oh, okay. As, uh, I if you sort of mean, like I, I like I, I like I I think I, the, I I don't think I don't think this is true. I, I don't think it's true. I, I don't think it is setting up a, a kind of rival authority. But I'm I'm kind of curious about the tension between 
or like or like or, 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 or like the the impulse to enumerate and codify in, in that way i suppose you know uh, or like and like, and like and like how how it would be if we didn't if we didn't say here are 73 ways or like if, you know um, i'm with you i i i'm yeah. with you okay i get i can answer that in as much as i really like lists and i think lists clearly the moment you have a list what's the what's the um old cliche you only know um, the, a, a boundary when you crossed it or something like that, or when you come up against it. And so I made 73 because that's as many as I could make. But to say there are 73, God, the, you know, there could be 173, there could be 12. You can change each of my methods. And I think what's interesting, you know, with the Ulipo N plus seven about the kind of authority there, that's why I think it's really exciting that the, you, you can suddenly have n plus one and n plus 14. And so if you, you, you look for me, my translation methods are nearly always dirty translation methods in as much as, you know, the idea of like a poet like Jackson Maclow, where he sticks to the constraint. For me, yes. it's, it's kind of like, I'll do the constraint. And if one of the words is really <laughs> just rubbish, I'll change it. Fuck it. I'm the boss, right? Um, yeah. I can do what I like. And so that idea of having a method, the method is the thing that gets you towards the good poem. But for me, the poem is as good as it could be once I fiddled around with it um, and asserted my authority is the wrong word, but I'd like to think it's the wrong word, but kind of gone. This is what works for me at the moment. Yeah, thanks. That's great. <laughs> Very nice to see you. You too, you too. Thanks for coming along. Okay. Uh, thanks, for that, Daniel. Uh, Maria Jesus has a question. She writes, I think these methods are really interesting and fun to work with, but I was wondering where you would draw the line between a translation and a new piece of writing. Um, I, do you have any writing that isn't translation in some way, Tim? Yeah, loads of, well, yes and no. I mean, there's the cliche with Ezra Pound, which, what's the cliche? Um, all of his original poems were translations and all of his translations were original poems. And before I started, I mean, Horace was my first published book of translations where I was really messing around with the work. And that came out, I was doing them in 2001 and two, I guess it would be. And so, a couple of books came out before that, before I was before I was telling people that what I did was translation. Um, and so Folklore um, is the first book, Salt published that, and there was no translation in that. But in a way, I would, I, I mean, seriously, I would say in a way, I feel like I was doing some kind of elusive translation method of Gertrude Stein's Tender Buttons and a lots of books about beekeeping, where the kind of that kind of language was coming into the work, and um, a lot of books about the geology and folklore of the Malvern Hills, where I was writing about. And so, I mean, translation is such a slippery word for me because translation means kind of relation and it means conversation. And I can't imagine. I mean, as, as you know, as 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 we all know, the moment you see someone creative writing, a student who's doing creative writing, where they're not having conversations with other people, the, the writing is almost universally terrifyingly bad. And so it's always a conversation for me. And in a way, what, the reason I'm here today, I've, I've in, at least in part, right, is because I really got into doing original poems, which I called translations. Perfect. Thanks so much for that, Tim. I think we are more or less out of time now, so we can probably, uh, we can probably stop. But yeah, thanks, thanks once again, um, Tim, for the paper today. Thanks everyone for coming. There's gonna be another one of these, um, another one of these ongoing seminars at the beginning of November. I think it's something like the 5th of November where Philip Terry will talk about Dante and modern translations of Dante. Um, so yeah, more in the same veins. So if you enjoyed what um, Tim had to say today, I'd love to see you back for that. I will be sending out information to everybody about that. 
uh, in due course. Again, if anyone wants the presentation from today, there'll be a recording available and a PowerPoint and everything. It'll be on Canvas for people from my course. Other people get in touch and we can sort something out, I'm sure. But yeah, once again, thanks, Tim. Thanks for that. Thanks. Can, and and can I just say, if, if anyone wants to drop me a line, ask me a question, um, tell me I'm all wrong. I'm, I'm all ears. I'm ready to. So be a pleasure to talk. Okay. Oh, perfect. Thanks so much, Tim. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Blenny, as well.